Okay, so again, good afternoon or good morning everyone. This is again APNIC e-learning web class. For today's discussion, we will be doing OSPF or Open Shortest Path First, so OSPF Basics. In this class, it, there is some assumption that you have an idea, a working background perhaps on routing and some routing basics. If not, we will go through um, a series of things that um, basically defines what OSPF is. Um, we will try to cover some um, routing basics as well if we need to. But essentially, it is best if you already have some idea of routing and networking in general. Now, today is the 10th of July in 2013. It's 12.30 in the afternoon from where I'm broadcasting this class, which is in Brisbane in Australia. Now, this class, again, will run for one hour. We will allot about 45 to 50 minutes for the class proper. And the rest of the time is for administration, housekeeping stuff, and also for any questions that you might have towards the end. Um, however, I do encourage participation in the class. So if you have questions at any time, please feel free to write them down on the chat panel. You already know where it is. It's on the lower right-hand side of your screens. Now, that is the only way that you can communicate with me. All, com um, all basically, all um, things that you want to tell me will be using the chat because we don't allow audio and video coming from participants. So it's only one way, audio and video from me, and from you, it has to be using the chat. This is so we can, um, in the interest of bandwidth, basically, we want everyone to have access to this class, but there are people and there are participants who are coming in from areas where bandwidth is very limited. So we want to still cater for um, those types of um, connections so we'll try to keep the um, bandwidth as minimum as possible. Now, I'd like to also introduce myself because you will be seeing me for the next one hour. My name is Cheryl Hermoso. I'm a training officer with APNIC. I've worked with APNIC for the past two years now. And as part of the training team, we conduct trainings, workshops, and um, tutorials to the members of the internet community in the Asia Pacific region. I'm pretty sure you've heard about APNIC before. APNIC is the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. It is the number um, registry, the internet registry for the Asia Pacific region. So as part of APNIC, we conduct trainings that are related to internet technologies and you can see from my specialties over there that those are the topics that we cover. Network security, IP addressing, IPv4 and IPv6, routing, DNS and DNS security, and internet resource management. So basically that covers all of the number of resources, IPv4, IPv6, and um, autonomous system numbers. Now this class will be for one hour. We will take some time towards the end to fill up the survey. I will post the link to the feedback form at the end of the class. So if um, anything, we would like to get your feedback with regards to the quality of this presentation. And also, if anything, like questions or suggestions that you may have towards the end, please feel free to write them down as well. Now, this is the second of our three e-learning sessions for the day. Actually, we're having four for today. Um, apart from the, well, usually we do three, but today we will be doing four. Following this is BGP basics and BGP attributes. So if you're interested in that, that is, that it is the next literal step from OSPF class. Now, what will we be covering for this class? Now, again, this discussion will focus on the basics of OSPF routing protocol. This is a technical topic. It is aimed at people who wish to advance their knowledge of routing and of IP networks. I understand that perhaps some of you may already have some background of routing. Hopefully that is the case. So um, some of you may just need a bit of refresher on that. We will try and cover that too. With the popularity of OSPF as an IGP, there is also a big chance that maybe some of you already have implemented OSPF before. So it's just going through the concept of how, how OSPF works but you've already done the implementation part. Maybe that is the case for you. But then here, being an introduction of sorts, we will be looking at the concepts of OSPF, what it is, basically what you can see on the overview here. We'll look at the features. We will look at link state routing protocol, which is essentially the type of, um, or the category where OSPF belongs to. What are some of the features of OSPF? Fast convergence, it's one of them. So we'll look how that is done. 
Also, what is or how does OSPF actually work? What are the steps involved in its operation? We will look at the neighbor discovery process for OSPF, which is essentially how will you find the neighbors in the OSPF topology? What are the different packet types and the formats and how do they exchange these packets between the neighbor routers? And lastly, we will look at the network topologies that are using OSPF. So that's what we're planning to cover for this session. Hopefully, that's what you are looking forward to. If there are other things that are outside of this scope, hopefully we have an extra time later on to discuss them. And please feel free to write them down on the chat. Or if you don't have time to cover them as well, please feel free to write them down on the feedback form so we can add them on later sessions. Or if we need extra sessions for OSPF, we can also do that. Now, um, that is the housekeeping part. I think it's now time to just go on ahead and start what we are here to tackle, which is OSPF. First of all, what is routing? Because when we talk about OSPF, we have to be very well aware of, we have to be on the same page. We all have to know what routing is. So basically, routing is the process of forwarding packets between networks. All right. It uses any layer 3 device, either a router or a gateway. So OSPF is a routing protocol. OSPF stands for Open Shortest, Shortest Path First. So this routing protocol is very popular now. It is a type of a link state routing protocol. So basically, there are three types. Um, two types before OSPF was created, there were two. There is distance vector, which is a very old one. And then there's link state routing protocol, which is a newer one, which we will be discussing now. There is another one called path vector protocol. And when we discuss PGP on the next um, session, then you will learn more about how path vector protocol actually works. But in this class, our focus is on link state routing protocol. It uses the SPF or the shortest path first technology. Now, it has been developed by OSPF working group in IETF. And the first RFC that you will want to look into if you want a clear description of the specifications is RFC 1247. Now, there are two types of OSPF, which will be clearer to you as we go on along in this class. There is OSPF version 2 for IPv4, and there is OSPF version 3 for IPv6. So those are two separate instances, two separate um, processes that should be running if you want to run both IPv4 and IPv6. The specifications for OSPF version 2 is in RFC 2328. And for version 3, it's in RFC 2740. So you might want to have a look at that if you want to know the differences between version 2 and version 3. But basically, it, version 2 caters for IPv4, version 3 will cater for IPv6, okay? So that's a bit um, forward, but now let's just go through the, the benefits or the specifications and the features of OSPF first. Now, these are the things that describes OSPF best, okay? OSPF is designed for TCP IP environments. It is designed for IP networks. We'll explain that later on, but basically, OSPF is just meant for IP networks and nothing else. It is designed for fast convergence. This is a good feature of uh, OSPF. Convergence is a timing unit. You can say that it's a, it's a timing parameter that determines how quickly your OSPF or the protocol itself will be able to forward the packets. Okay, so the start of the routing protocol in your router, okay, is when it starts to learn the topology. After it learns the topology, it will then build the routing table. Okay, there are three types of table. We will discuss this in the next few slides. Basically, it starts off with learning the topology and then building the routing table. And once it has the routing table, he can then forward the packets. So then the convergence time refers to the actual point where it starts learning the topology all the way up to when it starts forwarding the packets. That is the convergence time. So in OSPF, this is done really, really fast. If you are using VLSM or variable length subnet masking in your networks, okay, OSPF is also able to support that. 
Okay, so also OSPF can route any of those variable subnet masks. So if you're familiar, in the early days we're using classful addressing, right? So if you're still using like RIP, RIP, which is a distance vector protocol, it doesn't have any support for VLSM. It's only for classful addressing. With OSPF, it already has support for VLSM. Okay, so if you want to forward packets for discontinuous subnets, you can also do that. You can also do incremental updates. So if there are changes in the network topology, only the changes or the updates will be sent to the neighbor and not the entire topology, which is a good thing because you're saving up bandwidth there, especially if you have a lot of um, routers uh, involved or included in your, um, in your topology. You can also do route authentication with OSPF, okay, which is a good thing. It has support for route authentication. So basically, um, you set up um, access to which types of routers will be able to get um, updates from you or set up passwords and things like that. It also runs on IP, which is essentially just protocol 89. OSPF can be useful for IP networks if you see OSPF the way it sends control information, it only works, it, it only sends those using IP addressing. There is a dependency on IP, so OSPF will not work otherwise. So if you um, basically um, like run OSPF on your network, you'll see that this is a very crucial um, feature of OSPF as well. Okay, any questions so far? So basically, we just listed down those features. As we go on with these slides, you will understand um, all of those more and more. We will look into them more clearly as we describe the steps that are involved in the um, establishing of the neighbors and like how they send um, types of different types of information to each other, uh, the different packet types going to the different neighbors and all that, we will look into them. But for now, because we said that OSPF is a type of a link state routing protocol, let us discuss link state routing protocol. What is it? How does it work? Now, this is a schematic diagram of the link state routing protocol, okay? We'll try to give you just a visual idea of what or how exactly it will work using this. Now here, you can see in this diagram, we have four routers. So this is router Q, router X, router Y, and router Z. So those are your four routers. Okay, This is just an example, so we'll just limit it to four routers. There are a number of links between these routers. In all these routers, there are different networks. You can see this um, square ones here. Um, just to show you that these ones are possibly different types of networks that are connected to those routers in a certain manner, in a certain fashion. Each network will have its own prefix, of course. Each network will have its own path, its own cost, and so on and so forth. When we use link state routing protocol, each routing table in here maintains their own topology database. Okay. Now, from this topology database, each of the routing protocol will use its own SPF algorithm. Okay, so you have OSPF running on each of these router. Each of them will definitely have their own SPF algorithm. They will share the same topology database. Okay, so from this topology database, each routing protocol will then use its SPF algorithm to select the best path. So when you say the best path, it is the shortest path based on the SPF algorithm. It will find the shortest path um, among all those possible links. So in such a case, each of the routers will give the best route based on their current position and their current location. Okay. So if you notice in this diagram, so say router Q, router Q, the best path could be different from the best path that is generated by, let's say, router Z here, okay, or even router Y for that matter. The topology table can be identical, but the routing table could be very, very different, okay? So the bottom line is all that these routers, although they belong to the same topology, they are only sharing the same topology database. When they calculate the SPF or the best path, each router uses its own SPF algorithm to compute 
and select for the best stat. So that's how it will essentially work. It will create different types of tables at, as we will see in the later slides. Any questions? So this is just um, a list down of what we've uh, pretty much told you in the previous slide. What is link state routing? Link state routing does not send any full routing tables on periodic intervals. Okay, this is another feature. So that is really why we can do fast convergence. They're not sending full routing tables, which is very different with distance vector routing. In distance vector, they will give a copy. Let's say I'm router A, I'm sharing with a neighbor, router B. Router A will share its full routing table to router B. So that means router B now has been influenced by router A's routing table. Is that right? This is what we sometimes call routing by rumor. So it's based on hearsay. It's based on what router A can see in the network. That may be the, um, the table, the routing table that he has, okay? But that is not essentially what's the best path if it's computed from router B, okay? So that's how distance vector works. In link state routing, that's not the case as we've said. They only share what? The topology table. It maintains three tables to collect routing information. We have a neighbor table, a topology table, and a routing table. What's the differences between these three? The neighbor table is essentially a list of all the neighbors. Okay? How does the router find out the neighbors? There, there is a process of finding that. We'll, see, we'll look into that in a later slide. That is your neighbor table. After that, it also has a topology table which contains all the routing information, all the possible optimal paths going to different destinations, and even the suboptimal path. Now, you will find out later on why suboptimal path is necessary here. Okay, this is so it can easily compute the optimal path again. Okay, so which will result in fast convergence. The third one in the tables is called the routing table, which essentially just contains the optimal path, the best path. When, let's say, the optimal path goes to the routing table from the topology database, okay, the suboptimal path is maintained, it is retained in the topology database, in the topology table, okay? Why? If, let's say, the best path goes down, okay, what happens? You don't want to go back to the neighbors and start all the computations all over again, get the all the possible paths, get the topology table and everything. No, if the best path goes down, you have the suboptimal paths available on the topology table. It's already waiting there. It's contained in the topology table and can now be passed on to the routing table. Okay? Now using the SPF algorithm, it your, your router can now again select the best path. Okay, so that is the that is really why we, we want that there. Okay, each router will use its SPF. Any questions? It sends very small periodic hello message to maintain the link condition. Now this is um, essentially to maintain the link condition. This is how they maintain the link state. For example, we have router 1 and router 2. Router 1 and router 2 are neighbors. They will build their neighbor relationship, then building the routing table from that, and then they will start sending and forwarding packets. That's how it works. This is our usual flow. At some point in time, if let's say the link between R1 and R2 goes down, how do we know that um, it went down. How does each router know about it? There is a certain control signal, which we, we know as the hello signal, that is sent at certain intervals of time between these two neighbors. And this will determine the neighbor status. So the amount of time depends on the topology, but normally for Ethernet links, it is around 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, each router will send hello messages to each other. So this is how the router can identify that the router link is down. Okay? They send periodic law messages to maintain link state. Okay? They also send trigger updates. So what, what's triggered updates? If let's say any network goes down 
and that router is participating in OSPF, then what happens is it will send a trigger update to the neighbors to let them know that the link is down. The neighbor router doesn't really have to wait for the next hello message anymore. Any hello updates after 10 seconds, he doesn't have to wait for that. They would know right away that the link is down and therefore can make the proper computations. Okay, so those are the advantages of link state routing protocol. And because OSPF is a type of link state routing protocol, it has also inherited those characteristics. Any questions so far? We've already discussed this. There are three tables basically in link state routing protocol. Um, this is the data structure. First, it will create a neighbor table, which is a list of all the recognized neighboring routers, okay, to whom they will interchange or will they send and receive any routing information. It will create topology table from those routing information received from that, okay, and from the topology table, we will create a routing table. Topology table, by the way, is also called the LSDB or the link state database, which maintains a list of all the routers and all their link information, any network destination, prefixes that are connected to that, link costs for that is also in our topology table. Now from that, they will create a forwarding table, which contains only the best path to forward your data traffic. Okay, It uses the SPF algorithm, as we've said, to create the routing table from the topology table. Okay, we've mentioned SPF a few times already all throughout the beginning. So let's look at how SPF works. It's actually very easy. This is how our SPF algorithm works. If you want to have a look at this diagram here. Now, every router, again, shares what? The same topology table, same topology database. We have here router X, okay, which is the black um, colored router here and then we have routers A, B, C, D all the way up to H. Okay, let's just say for example that we want to um, create the SPF tree path. We will do the calculation from let's say router X going to router F. So from router X have packets going to the network in router F. What is the path from X to F? So you can see here there are many possible destiny ah sorry many possible paths going to our destination which is router F. So from X you can either go X A D F. That's one possible way. You can go X D F which looks like um, a faster uh, way to do it only if they all have the same cost. You can also go via X C D, F, X, C, E, G, D, F. Okay, it's getting longer and longer. You can still go by X, B, C, E, G, D, F. So those are all the past possible paths. Okay, each of those have different costs in real setting. In this example, let's just say that all of them have the same cost. Each path, okay, each link, let's say from X to A, that is cost that costs 10. So when you count from X to F going via A and D, that is 30. If it's going from X to D to F only, that is 20. Okay, X, C, D, F, that is also 30. And then if you wanna go the longer path, X, C, E, G, D, F, that is around 50. Okay, so from this, we've already calculated the branches, the path costs associated with them. We've calculated the best one which we found out to be XDF because it's 20, that is the best path. It's got the lowest path cost and therefore will be forwarded onto the routing table. That's how it works. In real life, as I've said, maybe this link X to A will have a different path cost than the rest of the different branches. Okay? Maybe at some point um, we said we can have suboptimal paths. Maybe if this link, this is a best path, right? X going via D going to F, if this path goes down, then he also has, he can also easily calculate the path or the, the, the costs going to F via other links because it has that in the topology table. All right, so bottom line, when any router starts building their routing table, 
they put them on top of the SPF3, which is what we did here. Um, router X is right over on the top, and then from there, they will build the branches of the tree, calculating all the possible paths to the destination, and then add up the path costs until they build up or until they can find out the, the costs for each link going to the destination. All right? So that's how SPF tree works, and that's how you calculate the, the path costs using SPF. Any questions? All right, so we've pretty much covered the, the features of link state routing and also, of course, of OSPF. There are a few more features here that I'll be covering, such as low bandwidth utilization. One advantage of link state routing protocol and OSPF, of course, is this one, low bandwidth utilization. It uses very small bandwidth from the link so that all available bandwidth of that link can be used to forward data traffic. So how do we achieve that? The only change is when the topology table has been built. After that, if they maintain the table, only the changes. So see here, um, you can't actually see it very clearly here, but basically this is link state advertisements. So basically any changes will be done using this type of message. So only these changes will trigger any updates to the neighbors. They send this via multicast as well. So um, this one here, it is sent via multicast. And as you know, all the advantages of multicast are here. Only the members of the multicast group, so essentially all the um, OSPF speaking routers will be able to, and listening to that multicast address will be able to receive those updates. So this is why it uses less bandwidth you get to send a, a single packet, let's say coming from this router, router one here, and then that will be replicated all, to all the um, participating routers in the network. No need for him to create many different packets going to let's say 10 or 20 routers. All he has to do is generate a single packet and that is automatically uh, replicated and shared to all those that are participating in this network. So that's what we mean by low bandwidth utilization. Fast convergence. So um, SPF algorithm is also known as Dijkstra algorithms. You already possibly already know. Now one advantage of that, let's say if um, if the primary path goes down, what happens? You already have the alternative path. It's already in the topology table. So your router or the router who's connected to that link will be able to identify that and will be able to detect that. Okay. After that, they can quickly send um, notifies to everyone and then quickly run SP new SPF algorithms in the path. Now to find a new route, Okay, when a network change, let's say, happens, okay, it's been detected, of course, in the previous slide there. Now, the router who detected this change will send a trigger. It will send, again, the same type of um, message, which is the LSA or link state advertisement. It will send them to all the neighbor routers, okay? And then they will identify the change. If the topology change happens, they can quickly run the SPF algorithm again to find the next best path. Okay, so that's how it achieves fast convergence. Any questions? Okay, now just to list down the basic OSPF operation. Now, with the previous slides, when I say link state advertisements and all that, that's part of the OSPF operation. But the actual steps involved in, is from building up neighbor relationships all the way up to building up the routing table and forwarding packets, right? So what are the different stages of OSPF operation? The first one is neighbor discovery. The first job, of course, of an OSPF, let's say a router, which is part of an OSPF um, topology, is to find or to discover the neighbors. How does it do that? He will send L3 messages or hello messages to the connected links. So let's say, in, in one link, um, OSPF is activated. On this links, he will send, again, a multicast message to find the neighbors, okay? And then they will exchange the topology table or the topology database 
or also we also call that the link state database or the link state table. So when the hello message is received by the neighbor, if that neighbor is listening to the OSPF multicast address, then he will be able to reply to that. He will send what we call an acknowledgement for that hello message. And that's really how they will build up these neighbor relationships. This is when they will start exchanging the topology table. Okay, different types of messages are being passed through. We'll discuss that in the next slide. Basically, that is the essential step for building a relationship. He will acknowledge the hello message first and then send uh, and exchange the topology table. Okay, and then again, it's sent via mo uh, multicast, via L3 multicast. So essentially, all control messages are sent via multicast. And then the next step is um, he will build the, the routing table okay, based on the um, selected best path, based on the algorithm. Okay? Then that is how, how, how basically um, how, how it happens. It will build up the routing table using the L SPF algorithm. Now let's focus a bit more on the neighbor discovery part. Here on the next slide here, this is how the neighbor discovery process works. Now, <clears throat> assuming, let's say, we, we have this topology here, okay? So this is your router. This two other routers here are also part of your network. They're all running OSPF. So um, this setup actually, in, in the terms of OSPF, it's called a broadcast multi-access network, okay? So all three routers, they're connected to a central switch. And what happens here, of course, is we will try to follow the steps in the previous slide, okay? Um, first, it will build up the neighbors, okay? You configure the routers to use OSPF. Initially, they are in the down stage, okay? This is the state. They are in the down state. Now, all these three routers will send their address to a packet destination, which is the following IP address. Um, this is the multicast address, 224.0.0.5 if it's IPv4, or FF02 colon colon 5 if it's IPv6. This is the multicast address for the group. Okay, The multicast message will be sent to this address and therefore will be received by all the routers. This stage when the routers send this multicast hello message is what we call the init state or the initialization stage, okay? So from down state, we are now in the init state. After that, okay, um, now all these neighboring routers with OSPF enabled should have received the hello packets, right? So from the initial, from the previous stage, which is the init stage, okay, we've already sent out the hello message to them. They will check the contents of this hello message. Okay, so it's not it's not instant. They will first check the, the contents of this hello message. Okay, what's in here? What what are the contents? I'll show you what is in this hello message in the next slide when you show you the packet. But in here, the information that are already included in the hello message must be able to match with the information that's already stored in that router. Okay. So that is how they will build this two-way relationship. They must belong to the same group, so to speak. Okay, so that stage is what we call the two-way state. Okay, so we've already done three. And then after that, um, okay, this is already the content of a low packet, but basically in, in this stage, when when you have you are in the two-way state, that is when they will be able to. Um, this is not exactly the the neighbor relationship just yet. Okay, it's it's the two-way state, but the contents of that is this once. This is your hello packet. You have your router ID. You have hello and dead intervals, which must match with the neighboring routers. You should have an area ID. Okay, this area ID is usually represented as um, 32-bit dotted decimal um, 
format. So we usually use the IPv4 address for this, even if we're using IPv6 with OSPF. So basically, that's 32 bits. Those information, hello and dead intervals, area ID, and any authentication information, if you want to do router authentication, then you need to inf uh, supply this. Now, these three must match with the other routers in the in, in the in the group okay in the topology so when they receive it okay they will compare it with the ones that they have and it should match so after that after that 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 hello message is still part of the two-way state right now after that in building the two-way stage they will now exchange their summary database table. They must decide at this stage which one will start sending it first. Okay, so which actually, how do we choose among all the routers in the network, how do we choose which one to send first? If all of them start together, of course, there will be chaos. Okay, it, it, it won't be a success. They will have to decide which one to go first. So how do they do that? the one with the highest router ID will start the process, okay? Again, it all boils down to the router ID, um, this one, router ID in the hello packet. So the first one or the one with the highest will start the process. This uh, decision process it is what we call the, um, this one, X start stage. After that, they exchange the link state database, which is what we now call the exchange state. So those are the steps involved in um, in basically discovering your, uh, say, neighbors, the neighbor discovery process. Okay? Any questions? Okay. There seems to be none, so I'll just continue with the next slides. Okay, now here, once a router has received the, the link state database basically from the others, okay, the router will have to do a few things. First, it will check what they just received, okay? Then they will also check whether they already have it, okay? So they've, um, they've gotten the LSDB from the, the, the router with the highest router ID. Then three possible things can happen here. One is, when I do the checks, when I receive the LSDB, one possible thing that will happen is if this, if, if my router already has the latest and the most updated version of this database, okay? So if it's the same topology, if it's the same network information, there's a field in the database containing the sequence number. If its sequence number is higher than the one that it's received, okay, or the received sequence number is lower than what it already has, then that means that it already has the latest version or the um, most updated version. What they will do next is to discard what they received and then it will send the one that they have back to the sending neighbors, okay? So um, basically, the one that is being sent to my router, okay, is not the latest. So I'll have to inform them that I am holding, I actually have the most updated one, okay? So that's one possible thing. If I have the updated one, I will discard what I have been given and I will forward, I will send the one that I have to the rest of my neighbors. If the sequence number that I received now is higher. So the next possible thing is if it's higher, then I will accept it, okay? And the router will now override the topology table that I previously have. Now, if I don't have a topology table yet, which is the third possible thing that can happen, then I will now ask for the full information, not just the updates. So I will tell the others that um, they should send me the full information on that particular network update. When that comes, that's how it will build its topology table. 
all right so at this stage we're already in what we call the full stage they will synchronize their whole topology table okay so that's the sequence that we follow when we are creating um, neighbor relationships with everyone else in the network that is running OSPF. Any questions? I hope that's clear enough. So basically, we just um, run through the process on creating our table itself, okay? Because that's how we get them from the others in the network. Now, how do we maintain routing information? So that's in the next here. Um, I've told you about hello messages, which is used by for essentially everything. First is to establish neighbor relationships and then to exchange information. It's also used to maintain the information, to, to maintain the link state. Okay, so to maintain the routing table, we send periodic low messages every 10 seconds to make sure that the links are still active. Okay, then that's how before that, if, if once that is sent out, they can now send trigger updates if there's a need to, if there are any topology changes in the network, they can also maintain the link state using a sequence number to ensure that all the information are up to date. Okay, so any link state advertisement actually is associated with a sequence number. They always check their database whether they receive the LSA, which has probably the same sequence number or perhaps a more updated sequence number than what they already have in their database. So if it's a match, again, it will be discarded. If it received a higher one, then it will be overridden. If it received a lower number, then it will be discarded and their own topology table will be sent out to the rest of the neighbors. So this is, this is the actual process that works, okay? That's how they maintain the routing tables updated with everyone else. Okay, that process, simply just go on. If there's a link down, then they will have to send trigger updates again and then it will be updated to all the other routers. All right, any questions? Okay, now, um, so by now you already know how OSP works. Let's look at the different, um, basically the different packet times that are being sent through all throughout the process. We've already told you about the hello messages. You're already familiar with this. Its main function again is to what? Build adjacencies or links between neighbors and to maintain those link states. Again, it is sent every 10 seconds. Now let's look at the other four. There are five different packets that are being sent out. The next one is database descriptor packet or DBD. DBD for database synchronization between routers. So it's basically just used to synchronize the topology database among the neighboring routers. It usually contains the topology information. The next one is the LSR or the link state request packet. Okay, now um, these are request specific link state records, but why do we use it? If say any router has a router forwarding request, and let's just say that it's not available. Maybe you've already checked my routing table, it's not in there, we've already checked the topology table, um, it's not possible in there. Now the router who has this request will send out okay, a query to all the neighbors asking for any information. So it's like asking, do you know how to forward this packet? I have this kind of packet for this destination, but I don't have it on my routing table. Can you tell me how to get to this? Do you have this on your routing table? Now, if a reply comes, then he can build a routing table based on that and forward the packet. If there is no reply coming from any of the OSPF routers, and then this particular packet will be discarded. So that's the purpose of a link state request packet so that he can send out any queries to the other neighbors for any type of information that he might need. Okay, and then the third, uh, the fourth one is LSU or the link state update packet. So this is also specific for any link state records. If any changes happens in the network, then the LSR request comes from the downstream routers perhaps, and then the reply will be using the LSU type packet. Okay, so LSR, uh, LSU is used to uh, any 
uh, update replies to a link state request packet. The last one is LSAC, which as you can see here is for acknowledgements. So OSPF actually has a form of acknowledging, acknowledging the different packets that it has received. Okay, any of the above packets, well, whether it's a hello, a, a DBD, an LSR, an LSU, it will be acknowledged using an LS app packet. Okay, now the reason they do this is to ensure reliability. Okay, OSPF uses IP to exchange control information. It doesn't really have any built-in reliability mechanism. Okay, uh, it's like a connectionless oriented, but um, that's why with OSPF, um, this type of packet is created so that there is still some form of reliability for any OSPF messages being sent through. All right. Any other questions um, from the class? Anything? Any thoughts? Okay, now all five OSPF packets will have this form. Okay, this is the, 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 the packet um, um, fields that you will see in an OSPF packet, whether it's either of those things. So these are the uh, different headers. Um, you can see in the, uh, sorry, in the header field, these are the different fields that you can see. So you have your version number, you have your type, you have your packet length. Okay, we've already see, saw that in the hello packet earlier. You have your router ID, which is essential. Your area ID, it will have a checksum. If you need um, any form of router authentication, you also have that there. Okay, authentication type and the authentication value and your data. So your OSPF packet is encapsulated in the IP payload. It's not using any TCP. Okay, so remember in the previous slide, we have LSAC here. Okay, um, that is how we ensure reliability for OSPF. Okay, these are just the definitions of these different packet headers. So you've already um, seen that in this diagram here. Okay, so what's, what's version number for, what is packet type. So the packet type essentially just describes or just tells you which of these five hello packets you're actually sending. Okay, so it's either type one up to type five. So you can see that on the packet type header field. You will also be told by the packet length, the length of your OS packet in, in bytes. You have your router ID here, okay, which is the source of the packet. It's not always a source IP address, all right, but usually you use the 32 bit, um, sorry, uh, yeah, we use the 32 bit um, IP address to use for our router ID as well. You can have checksums there, and we have your authentication type. Okay, um, in here, um, contains a summary of the, okay. So, well, basically this one, we've pretty much covered this when we described the different type of the five types of packets. So what is contained in each one? The field that says data in the diagram contains the OSPF packet data. Okay, remember here, this part, is your data field so this uh, describes what is contained on those data this is different depending on what type of packet is being sent so let's say for a hello packet the data field contains the list of all the ospf neighbors if it's a dvd um, type of packet then it contains a summary of all the lsdb the link state database including the latest sequence number if it's an LSR packet, then what is contained in there is the LSU, the type of LSU that it needs, and the corresponding router ID. If it's an LS update, then it will uh, contain the full, either the full LSA entry, any multiple entries can fit in one OSPF packet will be added to that. And if it's for um, acknowledgement, the data field is usually just empty. It doesn't have anything on it. Only has the header that will be sent out to the rest. Okay, this one is the um, header for OSPF version three. 
Now, what have we said earlier, um, the difference between OSV V2 and V3 is essentially for uh, the purpose of using either for IPv4 or IPv6. OSPF V2 is only for IPv4, OSPF V3 is only for IPv6. So if you want to run a dual stack network, you will need both OSPF V2 and V3. Okay, so they are separate um, processes altogether. Um, if you want only IPv4, then you can have only OSPF V2 and all that. All the fields that you see in here is basically still the same. There's no big change in the architecture of OSPF, but the change happens in the IP header, okay? So it still uses 32-bit address for the router ID. Only, okay, that is essential to know, right? Because when sometime in the future you just want to use IPv6 perhaps, it might change, this specification might change when we get to that point, but right now, remember that it's still using the 32-bit source address, which is the same as your IPv4 address. So if you remove your IPv4 address, um, just make sure that either you still use the same for your router ID or you use any random 32-bit address. Okay. Now, um, the router ID is always 32 bits. It's not 128 bits as of yet. Okay. So the common practice is still to use the IPv4 address here, okay? So there might be minor changes to that in the future, but um, as of now, that is the that is the case. Questions? Okay, so we've looked into the OSPF structure from a packet level. So what are the different packet types? What are the fields in the OS packet and so forth? Now let's look at different network topologies that can use OSPF. So if we build an OSPF network, it can be built using different topologies. Okay, Point-to-point -point networks using one or serial interface. It can also be Ethernet. You can use X.25. You can still use frame relay networks as well. Now depending on the topology, the way OSPF works, in building up their neighbor relationships will be different. So it is essential, it is necessary to understand the topology when you're building your OSPF network. Okay, topology is important to understand the OSPF. Okay, so these are the topologies that are supported by OSPF. Um, let's go to that slide. So these are the three types that are pretty much supported. You can have broadcast multi-axis, which is this. You can have point-to-point, -point where you have either two routers that are connected via serial interface. You can also have non-broadcast multi-axis, which connects to the one service, uh, the service provider one. They're providing either, let's say, X25, frame relay, or ATM here. So broadcast is not exactly allowed on this link. So now, on layer 2, how, will, how do you think will you send multicast frames in this type of situation? Okay, so you see it, it actually changes when, with different types of topology. So let's look at them individually now. Let's start with broadcast multi-axis. So again, this is the diagram for broadcast multi-axis. In this type of network, let's see how OSPF builds neighbor relationships. So generally, in this situation, it's like a LAN type network that uses Ethernet or maybe even token ring topology. But in most cases, it's using Ethernet. When all the OSPF routers exchange information, there is a possibility that bandwidth will be wasted, right? So what happens in this situation is you will assign or you will elect what we call a designated router or a DR. After that, they will also elect a backup designated router. So in this diagram, let's say we have how many routers here? We have five. Um, maybe this one here will be your um, DR and maybe this one your BDR or backed up uh, designated router. So it, it depends on how they will um, negotiate with that. So to have some form of discipline, when they elect the DR and the backup DR, um, 
the DR will be the, like, it will act like a leader in the USPF leg, okay? Now, for all these other routers, if let's say they need to send updates, they will not send it to everyone. What they will do is just send it to the DR. If let's say the DR is down, then they will send it to the backup DR because at that point, he will step up and act the role of a DR. All right. So to avoid chaos, not all of these routers here, here, here can just send to everyone else. You will need a DR and a backup DR. The DR is the leader. If let's say the topology for this router changes, he will need to send an update, not to everyone, but only going to the DR. And then the DR will then propagate that to the rest of the, uh, the neighbor routers here. So um, just to, um, to, to quickly summarize what we have here, in a broadcast multi-axis network, you need to have a DR. A DR will be elected, followed by a BDR. They all send a message, okay? Then the DR will send messages to all the other routers using the same multicast address, 224.0.0.6 for v4, ff02 colon colon 6 for IPv6, okay? This is the normal behavior of OSPF in a multi-axis network. So how do they now find out which one will be the DR, right? Um, how do they elect the DR? Um, they will check a priority. If they all have the same priority, what happens is they will check the router ID. So first, check the priority. If they all have the same, then check the router ID. Whichever has the highest router ID will act as the DR. The second highest will be the BDR. Now, packets will be sent to the DR or the BDR using the same IP address that I've, already, I've just told you about, but packets coming from the DR and the BDR going to the rest will be using dot five, K224.0.0.5 and FF02 colon colon five. That's the IP address for um, propagating um, the topology to the rest of the routers, all right? So all neighbor routers will now form full adjacencies with the DR and the BDR, then they will form two-way relationships with the other routers in the link and will exchange hello messages with them. Okay, so you still have router um, neighbor relationships with the rest, not just the DR and BDR. However, they're not sending any database information to the rest of them, only hello messages to establish that the link are still up. But any updates to the database, any database information will be going via the DB, uh, sorry, the DR and the BDR uh, routers. Okay, any questions? So we'll just skip this one part because I've already discussed this in the previous one. So how do we uh, find out which one's the DR and which one's the BDR and how do we send packets coming from there? Okay, so let's look at point-to-point -point networks, okay? So this is a second topology that we want to look into. When two routers are connected, let's say back-to-back -back using a serial link, okay? Usually, we use L2 encapsulation methods here, like uh, PPP, HDLC, and all that. So this one setup is pretty straightforward. There's no need for you to select which one will be the designated route or even a, a backup designated router because you only have two routers in this case. They build neighbor relationships still, which is a full OSPF neighbor relationship. They still exchange hello messages. So every 10 seconds, that's how, um, as usual, they have dead intervals of 40 seconds as well. It's still the same. So um, in, in, in this case, um, pretty much, it, it's really very straightforward because you only have two. You only just exchange information um, with each other. You need the hello intervals, you need the dead intervals. Your hello intervals is your 10 seconds for ethernet. It can be 30 seconds later on when we discuss, discuss non-broadcast links, that's 30 seconds. That's basically the packets that are sent to the neighbors to maintain the connectivity. Dead intervals, if I haven't discussed that earlier, that's basically also hello packets that includes the list of all the neighbor routers for which you send hello packets or for which you send or receive um, 
um, hello packets from within the dead interval time. So if the router does not receive a hello packets from a neighbor within this dead interval, then he can safely assume that that neighbor is down. Okay, so that is point-to-point -point connectivity or point-to-point -point type of network. Any questions? No questions? Okay. The last topology that we will look into is non-broadcast multi-axis networks. So this includes frame relays, ATMs, X25. So what does it mean to be a non-broadcast? So if you look at this diagram, we have a one service provider diagram. So essentially, if you need to send any packet, let's say from this side going to this side, um, it will be forwarded using what we call virtual circuits. So if you need to send packets back, you will establish another virtual circuits. So when the OSPF sends packets, there is no way for it to be forwarded to the other routers in this type of setup. It can only be sent once in the virtual circuit Okay, going to the destination address that's specified in the packet, but not forwarded to the rest of them. Okay, so in this case, DR, the designated router, or BDR, cannot be discovered automatically. Okay, therefore, it has to be built manually. All neighbor relationships must also be built manually. So how do we do that? You need to manually configure your neighbors Okay, on your router. So using a neighbor relationship statement on both sides, you will uh, configure that. That's the time, that's the only time that they can exchange hello messages once you have them manually configured. So that's the downside to having this kind of setup. You need to do everything okay, manually. Cannot do it as in the usual um, um, topology that we've described. So in the NBMA network, the default hello intervals is 30 seconds, not 10 seconds compared to that one, uh, the first two topologies that we've discussed. The dead interval for this is usually still the same as the previous ones, which is four times the hello interval. So now it will be around 120 seconds for NBA, NBMA. Okay, so... Um, that's pretty much it. That the three, that's what we want to cover here. So those are the three topologies that we want to discuss to find out the differences of how OSPF will work in these different types of topologies. Any questions from the class? So I didn't know what your background are, but hopefully this has been very useful for everybody in the class. That will be the end of our presentation. If you have any questions, this is a time to write them down on the chat. While you're doing that or while you're thinking of any questions, I will also write down the link to the survey. I've mentioned about this at the start of the class. I pretty much want everyone to please take some time to fill out this feedback form so we know whether this class has been useful for you. If it's too basic, please say so. If it's too advanced in your case, Please tell us your, uh, your background so that we know how to deliver this course um, to uh, different types of audiences in the future. Okay, if you want a copy of the slides, it's also available. It will be available from our FTP site, but uh, um, I won't put in the link here. After you fill out the survey, will you be automatically redirected to the FTP page and you can download a PDF copy from there. So if you don't have any more questions, I think I will end there. Just a few more reminders here. If you have any resources, please go and check with our help this, um, well, help this team. They'll be able to help you with any inquiries with regards to your IP addresses. So go and talk to them, have a chat with them, send them an email. If you want to talk in your local language, it's also very possible because they are very um, talented. They, they can speak different languages. And so you can always um, be confident in talking with them. So that's pretty much it. Next up after this, we will be having BGP basics and BGP attributes. So if you're interested in that, again, as I've said, that is the next logical step 
after this class. So we'll hope to see you there again. And so thank you very much for attending this session. Thank you for your time and for your attention. And we hope to see you again in our next e-learning sessions. Bye.